about that. Okay, good morning. Good morning, so our technical difficulties. Thank you for joining us here at Ohana, uh, where we are, where we exist to love others to the glory of God. Uh, thank you for joining us. If you are following us online, share the link, please. Okay, so um, again, thank you for being with us. I got, I want to share the scripture with you right now. It's from Psalms 139. 14 and 15. It says, I will praise you for I am fearfully made, fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. And skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Amen. Anyway, so here's some affirmation. I'm going to speak affirmation to you. We are fearfully and wonderfully made perfect in the sight of God. We stand in the sight of God made righteous through the, through the blood of the Son. So our prayer, is, our prayer this morning is that you would be receptive to the ministry of the Holy Spirit this morning. So uh, right now, let's bow our heads and pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, Father God. Thank you for, Lord, the hearts that, Lord, that you have called here today, Lord, to worship. We pray right now, Father God, and thank you, Lord, for Lord, just being here in our midst, Lord. We just pray, Father God, and thank you for the ministry, Lord, you have prepared for us in advance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand and worship, everybody. As I look back over my life, I can see how your love has guided me. Even though I've done wrong, you've never left me alone. But you forgave me, and you kept on blessing me. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Because of your mercy, 
never repay you, Lord, for what you've done for me. How you loosed my shackles and you set me free. How you made a way out of no way. Turn my darkness into day. You've been my joy in the time of sorrow. Oh, for my tomorrow. Peace in the time of the storm. Strength when I'm weak and warm. I can never repay you. Thank you. 
have a seat and take a look at the screen. Hello and good morning, Oana. Take a look at Connie. How are we doing this morning? All right, all right. So in this time of generosity this morning, as we just continue to give God glory through all things, we have been focused on God's kingdom activity through God's kingdom partnership. And for most of you, or if some of you who don't know, Oana Church has been going through a transition. But I would really say that the whole world has been going through a transition. Amen? And um, we have been so blessed to have many kingdom partners that I believe in God's sovereignty. He already mapped this all out. So today, we have Brother David Larson preaching today. And... This is David's family. And I, I really hope that the next time we get to meet your family, David. But for today, kind of thank you that they didn't all come. Because my car was too small for even just the three of us in the car. So praise God. But um, the beauty of all of this, the transitions, the, the struggles, the trials, and how it points to generosity is God's got it all. God had it all from the very beginning. So we have been blessed to have many different partners come in and, and preach the word of God, which we solely believe here that that's the most important thing is God's word. Amen. So I want to bless you this morning with a scripture that comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 9 from verse 11 to 12. And it says, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it also is overflowing in many thanksgiving to God. So there are many ways that you can give to Ohana Church. And usually this is Ian's part. He's got it all mapped out. But thank God for the screen behind me and in front of me. You can give to PayPal. Let me look a little bit good. The diabetes kicking in this morning. It says info at Ohana, doctor, at Ohana Church. And you can also drop it off right here in 1967 Kinola Street. There's a mailbox out there. And you can text. Praise God for Kingdom Partnership. Yes, Lord. You can text it again at 84321 on the MO. I don't know what you're going through in this time. But I can tell you this, when you look at the generosity of God, no matter what you go through, I'm always reminded that in John chapter 17, when Jesus, they call it the high priestly prayer, it was pretty much his, that last intense prayer. Please go read it when you have time. And I want this to be your mindset. When you think about generosity, how he was so generous. In the part of the prayer that he's praying, it's so intense. Jesus is so selfless. None of it is about himself. You know that he was not only praying for those that God gave him then, but he was praying for those that are here now and those to come. So even thinking about that, even in your struggles or whatever you're going through, take yourself out of yourself. Put yourself in a mindset of Christ. Give glory to God for all that he has done for you through you, and will continue to do in your lives as you touch the lives of others. Will you please stand as we worship our Lord and Savior. God bless you. Aloha. Every 
You may have a seat. It's meant to be opened, explored, pursued. It's made to be read, reread, applied, and used. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, with wisdom, life changing, to lead us on. It's made for guidance to teach us his ways, showing what's true, right, and worthy of praise. It's meant to be hidden deep in our hearts, daily examined as the morning starts. No greater glimpse of God do we have, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Larson, and thank you so much, Johnny, for picking me up from the airport, Cr cramming me into his vehicle. Um, just a really another quick introduction. My name is David Larson. My wife and I, Lauren, have been married for six years. We have two kids, Micah, who's four years old, and then Lydia is two years old. Uh, we recently just moved back, or moved, not moved back, moved from Minnesota to Oahu. 
Uh, we've only lived here for like one day shy of four months, so we are very much mainlanders. Um, we live currently uh, in Kaula, next to Laie and Kahuku. Uh, so I am, I, I believe Chris Bruno has come here and preached before. So I, I serve with Chris Bruno uh, with Training Leaders International and serve at a seminary on Oahu. And it is my joy to bring the proclamation of God's word to you today. Um, it's my understanding that you are kicking off a sermon series on Second Thessalonians. And so let me just quick give a few remarks about uh, this letter from Paul. So what does 2 Thessalonians teach, and uh, what does it have to do with the first letter, right? This is 2 Thessalonians. So bear with me for a minute, just as I quick quote a commentator who I thought helpfully summarized uh, the meaning, themes, and purpose of this letter. So... Three developments in Thessalonica apparently caused sufficient concern to Paul and his colleagues for them to pen the second letter. First, we the, the need for continued endurance amid persecution received repeated attention. Second, a false belief had arisen claiming that the sequence of events leading to Christ's return had already begun. Third, the problem with idleness in the community already identified in the previous letter required a firmer reprimand. So those are the general uh, components and elements of uh, 2 Thessalonians, some of the rationale behind of it, and the message underlying it. So with that in mind, I encourage you as uh, we hear and listen uh, to God's word being preached to open or read with me uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. So hear the word of the Lord. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly. The love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. For he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling, and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray and ask for God's help. Heavenly Father, um, we ask now that you would come and help us. Help us to see Jesus Christ. Help us to honor him and praise him. And Father, I pray that you would keep me faithful to your word. Uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what David says, but it matters what your word says. And so may your spirit help us. May he cause the words and their meaning to be illuminated, to, to shine in our minds. Um, Father, I, I pray that if there's any uh, hindrance or anything uh, acting as a barrier to receive your word today, may you tear it down. And may you cause us with soft and fresh hearts to be eager to receive your word. Because 
your words are the words of eternal life. And it is only in your words and in your word, Jesus Christ, that we can have life. So, Father, help us now receive your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, I have uh, a, a really quick, brief outline. But before we go through that outline of today's sermon, I just want to open up really quick with uh, looking briefly at verses 1 through 2. Uh, and 1 through 2 we see a typical introduction from Paul. And notice I said from Paul, and that this is a, a letter from Paul. But when you look at the first, you know, first line of this letter, you see Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. And so why would I say this letter is from Paul when we see three names here? Well, if you go to near, near the end of the letter, in chapter 3, verse 17, this is, this is what we see. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. This is the way I write. So Paul is the writer, the author of this letter. And given that Paul includes Sylvanus and Timothy, it implies that they were there with him. And though uh, Paul is the primary one, or the one who wrote the letter, Sylvanus and Timothy could be seen as either co-senders or co-authors, even though Paul is the primary or principal author. So verses 3 through 12 form the, the meat of the rest of the passage. And just so we can kind of see where we're going here, there are basically three units or three parts of this message. And uh, this each part is basically a breakdown of the text. So verses 3 through 4, the example of endurance. Verses 3 through 4, the example of endurance. Second, verses 5 through 10 give us the result of endurance. 5 through 10, the result of endurance. And the third point, the final one, the purpose of endurance. Verses 11 through 12. So we have the example, the result, and purpose of endurance. That's where we're going today. And the main point of this sermon, and we'll see, we'll see this, woven throughout the very text of scripture, is this. This is what I want you guys to, to receive today. Endure together, because Jesus will return to punish the wicked and rescue his saints for his glory and by God's grace. Again, endure together, because Jesus will return to punish the wicked and rescue his saints for his glory and by his grace. So, the first part, the example of endurance, verses 3 through 4. So in verses 3 through 4, Paul says that he and his company ought to give thanks for this church, the church of the Thessalonians. And this is a right thing to do, to give thanks always. Now, we need to ask ourselves, why is it right for them to give thanks? Well, let's look at the verse. The second half of verse 3 tells us, because... So he's explaining why it's right for them to do this. Because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. So this sounds like a pretty rad church. Faith growing abundantly, and love of every one of you increasing. The love for one another is increasing. This is like, I want to be a part of that church. Uh, I hope you are very thankful with this church. But, I mean, when you hear that, it's like, I want to be either a part of that church or I want to be like that church. And for this reason, Paul says that they boast about the Thessalonians, about their, in verse 4, steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. So, the people, the church of Thessalonica, the people seem to be an example. They seem to be exemplary, uh, a model to which we are to follow. They not only grow and increase in faith and love, but they do so in enduring persecutions and afflictions. They remain steadfast and faithful. So if the Thessalonian church is a model for other churches, an example for other churches to follow, then 
scripture to strive, eagerly pursue, do what they can to strive together, to endure together, which entails and necessarily includes love for one another. Love one another and endure whatever it is you're facing. And in their case, they're facing persecution. And they're giving us an example of what it looks like to endure, growing in faith, even in affliction, even in trial, grow in faith and love one another. So no matter what season you are in as the body of Christ, as the church, no matter what you're facing, as those who are bought with Jesus' own blood, this is what you're to do. Endure together by growing in faith and increasing in love. Endure together by growing in faith and increasing in love for one another. So this church serves as an example, as a model for us to follow. And in this, right, I'm I'm trying to emphasize this. This isn't just uh, sometimes, even in the midst of affliction, we are to do this. And this endurance gives an, a result. There's a result to this endurance. So this brings us to the second part of our passage, verses 5 through 10, the result of endurance. Read verse 5 with me. I'm going to pay close attention here. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. So this is evidence that God makes a righteous judgment. So what is the evidence being spoken of here? Well, I believe the evidence of God's righteous judgment is what Paul says in the second half of verse 4. This is referring to something he previously just said, that your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring is a sign of God's judgment of God's just judgment, his righteous judgment, that they are enduring and that they are enduring specifically in persecution and affliction. Their persecution and affliction serves as a sign that God's judgment is just, is righteous, is right. Now, what, what, what is this judgment? What is this judgment referring to? Well, it's referring to the end time judgment. So the the Thessalonians' affliction and endurance will serve as evidence that God's future judgment is righteous, that it is right for him to punish the wicked, to punish the afflictor, and allow the faithful and the afflicted into his kingdom. So listen to how one uh, commentator explains it. I find this helpful. The the Thessalonians have provided evidence of God's righteous judgment by remaining steadfast and faithful amid persecution. Their suffering provides evidence that God is righteous in admitting them into his kingdom, since their willingness to endure persecution is a manifestation, uh, a demonstration of their faith in Christ. So their current situation of enduring persecution persecution and affliction will serve that proof or serve as proof that God indeed is righteous even in his judgment which means harsh God is righteous in his judgment to admit the faithful into his kingdom and to punish the wicked now let's continue reading in verses 6 and 7 since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to, the, to you who are afflicted as well to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. So verses 6 through 7 show why the Thessalonians' suffering and endurance will further show evidence that God is just in his future judgment, because it is right for God to repay the evildoer. It is right for God to repay the evildoer and reward the faithful. So know this. And I really mean this. Know this. God.
God will indeed righteously punish the wicked. And he will righteously, the merciful, enter his kingdom and be granted what? Eternal rest. What will this be like and what will this entail? Well, verses 6 through 10 explain. So let's reread verses 6 through 7 and go through verse 10 together. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed, God will pour out judgment on the wicked and give them great affliction. God will have and execute vengeance. And this future vengeance inflicted on the evildoer will be far worse than anything you can experience here on this earth. To suffer in this life for Christ is much better than to suffer the vengeance of the wicked. So what is this punishment? Well, what is this punishment that the wicked will receive? Verse 9. Let's look at this. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. And this is absolutely horrifying news for every unbeliever. And remember, we who do believe recall that we were once far off, brought in only by the blood of Jesus Christ. There is not, there, there, there is a certain, uh, there, there is no certain leveling. There's a level playing field. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. Every single one of us has sinned. Every single one of us has rebelled. Every single one of us, therefore, deserves this punishment. Just because I'm standing up higher does not mean I'm any better. Every single one of us are sinners and fall short of the glory of God and therefore deserve, right? We deserve eternal damnation. This is horrifying news for the evildoer, those who, according to verse 8, do not know God, and those who do not obey the gospel, the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will face eternal destruction away from the Lord. And listen to how other portions of Scripture describe this. Matthew 8, 12, Jesus describes it as the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Or Revelation 14, 11, The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. This eternal destruction isn't just a, a, an evaporation of existence. When we see the smoke of their torment, goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night. That is horrifying, frightening reality. And yet, alongside it, there are two components, two sides of joy. Joy particularly for the saints. So what are these two sides of joy? Well, one, God will have his vengeance. And repay the evildoer. Everyone deep down longs for justice to be had. Everyone longs for justice to be executed. When, when we see something wrong done in the community or in society or in our neighborhood, we want something to be corrected. We want justice to be done. There's something innate, internal in us that desires justice and know this. 
justice will be had by God. So that's good news for you because every wrong that's ever been done to you will be repaid. And further, it's even better news because Christian, you are free to endure and to turn the other cheek because vengeance belongs not to you, but to God. And he certainly will repay. So you are free simply to love. You don't have to seek that vengeance. You don't have to seek to repay others whenever they have done wrong to you. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. And so you are set free to simply love them. Second, while the evildoers are repaid with punishment, something radically different happens to the faithful. There's two things that happen to the faithful that I want to point out. So in verse 7, it says that God will grant relief to those who are afflicted. In other words, whereas evildoers are cast out into the darkness, where their, the smoke of their torment goes up forever, and they have no rest no, day or night, God grants his saints relief. They are brought into his very kingdom, into his presence. And why does that matter? Why does it matter that the saints are brought into God's presence? Well, listen to how Psalm 1611 describes God's presence. The psalmist says, In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. To be cast out of God's presence is to be cast out of the happy land of God. To be cast out of pure joy, but to be in God's presence is to partake, to participate, to actually enjoy God himself. The perfect bliss, the perfect good, the perfect one in whom there is fullness of joy. For those who believe, that's the result of enduring. With God forever in the fullness of joy and pleasure forevermore. We can often think about the end time and what it might be like to be with God in his presence and it will not be boring. God himself will be there. And he is our greatest joy. That is the glorious result of enduring. Enduring through painful affliction comes with great reward and that reward is God himself. Now, remember, though, God doesn't save the saints because unlike evildoers, they are good doers. No, God does not save people on the basis of their goodness or on the basis of their good works or on the basis of this person's better than that person because he or she does better things than that person. No. Your good works will never save you. You cannot hope in your good works. You cannot hope in yourself. Our good works are like filthy rags to be brought up to God. Your good works and you yourself will never save you. Why? Because all have sinned and therefore deserve death. But notice... Who are the ones being saved? In verse 10, it says, his saints, which is parallel and equated or equivalent to all who have believed, right? Those who have believed. It is through faith, by grace, that you can be and are saved. Why will these ones be saved? Why will they be saved? It is because they trust in Jesus and his perfect life, his death on the cross as a sacrifice and his victorious resurrection from the dead. They know themselves that they cannot save themselves. They know that they are equally deserving of death. And yet, they put their hope and trust not in themselves, but in the only one who, who can save, Jesus Christ. Listen to Acts 4, 11 and 12. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone, and is salvation 
and no one else. For there is no other name gi- under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. If you're looking to anyone other than Jesus Christ, there is only misery for you. If you are looking to yourself or to any other friend or whatever you do to save you, there is only misery and sorrow to be had. There's one name given under heaven by which we must be saved, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus, when he saves us, ushers us into his everlasting joy. And yet, while we are saved by grace, through faith, that doesn't negate or just reject any goodness or any good work that you are called to do. Listen to Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, and pay close attention to the sequence and order here. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Right? So it's all God, his grace, his gift, not your works. But he, being kind and merciful, saves by his grace. But then it goes on to say this. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God saved us by his grace, through faith, so that the logical result, the natural outflow, the natural fruit that would pr- be produced is that you would walk in good works. And this brings us to the final section of our passage. This is the, the final bit, the final part, the last point of our passage, the purpose of endurance. The purpose of endurance. Let's read verse 11. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. So in their affliction, Paul prays for the Thessalonians that they would be made worthy of his calling. But note, note, note something. Note what he doesn't say. What does he not say? He does not pray that the Thessalonians would make themselves worthy. He doesn't pray that. He prays that God would make them worthy. There's nothing that we can do to make ourselves worthy. When you came through those doors, you did not make yourself worthy enough to come through these doors. As you sit and hear the word being preached, you are not making yourself worthy. When you take communion, you are not making yourself worthy enough to take it. God qualifies you and makes you worthy only on the basis of Jesus Christ. No one is worthy, and no one can make themselves worthy, but God, through Jesus Christ, qualifies you to enter into his kingdom. And so Paul prays that God would make them worthy, and that they would do good, and that they would bring about the work of faith. The work of faith. And so this isn't just like off a whim or without any purpose, just kind of arbitrary. No, it has a purpose. There's intentionality here. Look at the first two words of verse 12. So that. These words indicate that there's a reason for godly living, a reason, a purpose to endure even through affliction. What is this reason? Well, let's just read the final bit of Uh, this passage, verses 11 and 12 together. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The purpose of godly living and enduring to the end is for what? The name of Jesus being glorified, specifically in you. And remember, glorifying God is the very essence of our joy. Pay close attention to that. Glorifying God 
is the essence of our joy. Because you were created to do that. Glorifying God is the essence of your joy. And glorifying God is also a way you can partake. There, there's a way to partake in that. Look at verse 12 again. Glorifying God does not exclude you. It includes you in some manner. Verse 12. So that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him. In the glorification of Jesus, there's also a glorification of the saint who is in Christ. Our union with Christ entails a glorification that we will have because Jesus Christ himself was glorified, raised from the dead, vindicated for all to see that he was indeed innocent, the son of God. Even though this is the purpose of every resolve and good work, every work of faith, remember, in your striving to endure, Paul prays that God would do this. And so there's no room for boasting. There is no room for you to brag, to make yourself think that you're better than any other person. As if you earned this glorification. No, that's not the purpose. Recall. The purpose is the glorification of Jesus. And you, wh why are you involved in this? Pay very, very close attention to the final phrase in verse 12. So that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, and you in him, according to what? According to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It is all grace. You are called to live a godly life and endure to the end by his grace and for the glory of Jesus Christ. And in glorifying Jesus Christ, you will find the greatest joy there is. So those who do not obey the gospel and believe the gospel will suffer eternal torment. Those who trust in Jesus and demonstrate that by their manning, manner of living, they will be brought into God's kingdom. Good works demonstrate, give evidence that they truly believe this good news of Jesus Christ. So there's a tension. I said that we all have a level playing field. Namely, that we are all sinners deserving eternal death, eternal punishment. So, how is it righteous for God to let us into his kingdom? Shouldn't God, if he is indeed righteous, punish every sin? If he's a God of justice, shouldn't we all be heading toward towards that same torment, that everlasting destruction. Why is it that God can remain righteous and yet let sinners enter his kingdom? One of my former pastors once said it this way, and I thought it's been very helpful in my opinion. He said, every sin, you, yours included, every sin is punished and will be punished. Every single sin. God does not let sin go unpunished. God punishes every sin, either in hell or on the cross. God is righteous because he does indeed punish every sin. The difference is, those who will, will, the wicked will have their punishment in hell, whereas we, we do not face that punishment. Those who believe in Jesus Christ know that he himself bore our sins on the tree. So that we who are sinners, who trust in Jesus, have that penalty paid. That penalty is gone. That debt is paid. That punishment forever wiped away. God is righteous because he has indeed punished that because Jesus Christ himself went in your place to die for you. 
every single sin you've ever committed, if you trust in Jesus, has been forgiven. The God who knows all things does not remember them anymore. Jesus took on the punishment of sin on the cross. He paid your penalty. He bore the wrath of God so that if you trust him, if you simply receive him in childlike faith, you would not find wrath, but the infinite joy of God. And so, to close out, if you're not trusting in Jesus, know this. Jesus will return and send every unbeliever into everlasting torment. Because you have rejected his free offer of grace. But no, there's still time. So long as it is called today, the offer of the gospel is for you. Jesus died so that sinners would have their penalty paid. Receive the gospel. For those of you who do know this, who are trusting in Jesus Christ, know this. Jesus has paid for every one of your sins. And you are completely forgiven. And because of that, you are called to endure. So with this last moment now, I just want to remind us, what is the main point? What is the main point of this passage. Endure together because Jesus will return to punish the wicked and rescue his saints for his glory and by his grace. That's the main point. That is the main point. Endure together because Jesus will return to punish the wicked and rescue his saints for his glory and by God's grace. Now, in this time after hearing God's word, we're going to respond in two ways, in song and in prayer. So I'm going to invite Connie and Ruby and my, myself. Uh, yes, I will invite myself. Uh, us three will be in the front here. And if any of you guys are needing prayer or wanting prayer for anything, we are here to serve you. Right? We are servants of the servants of Jesus Christ. So if there's any way we can be praying for you, please come up. Don't, don't just question, should I come up? This is a gift that God has given you to endure together. That means sharing your burdens with the body of Christ. So if you are needing prayer, please come up to one of us three and we'd be happy to pray for you. And let us praise and worship the great God who causes us to endure. All right, let us stand and worship.
Chapter 4, verse 16 says this, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So our hope is not only that Christ will return to rescue us, we'll be free completely free of this body of sin. To God be the glory. Amen. You may be seated. What an awesome message to continue to endure one another, to continue to love one another to the beauty of Christ. Amen. Mahalo again, Brother David. Thank you so much for coming and leaving your home, your ohana, your church to spend time to proclaim the gospel. Just a couple of things. Before I get into the announcements, just some some key points that were strong today, Dave. Strong. And to God be the glory. Endure together by growing in faith and increasing in love. And I want to also bring just a little bit more clarity, which I know you know, but some of us we're still growing. In verse 6. Where it talks about God and God doing the repaying. When I say still growing, it's natural in our humanistic mind 
when things happen to us, against us. I don't know about you, Hines, but I'm going to keep it real. I like Chuck Inak. You know? I just keep it real. But the heart of this passage right here, and what really came home for me was, Dave said it in the text also. I mean, as he was sharing and defining the text, he, simple Hines. Don't forget where you come from. Don't forget that you was that lost and sometimes still lost. Amen? So in that sense, when people hurt you, remember that we still hurt God with the choices we make daily. And the best part about this whole deal is the even knowing. The even knowing that your sin, that Jesus died for, my sin, that Jesus died for. I would ask for forgiveness right now and do them again tomorrow. I don't tell you that to condemn me. I tell you that. I tell myself that. To show the mighty works of a loving God. Earlier I talked about John 17. Please go and read that. Please go. Because two chapters later, Jesus is about to take the cross. And when I finally really got this, it's not that I finally really got there, but when I finally really got this, that His love, His grace, His compassion, even knowing two chapters later that He would die, and, not, and even knowing that after He died, those that He died for, then and now, because of our sinful nature, would continue to sin. But He would continue to love. He would continue to love. And He would continue to love. So I say this to encourage you. You might be like, oh, that don't sound too encouraging. You know why it's encouraging? Because it's nothing that you would ever do. It's nothing that you can ever do. But it's everything that He's done. So keep your eyes on what he's done. We have some of you, this week is going to be a hard week. My Tita Malia is going surgery. Whatever you're going through in your life, whether you're struggling financially, whatever you're struggling, well, I'm struggling with me. I struggle with me. That's the biggest struggle right here. All in this, yeah, head. Yeah. I'm just trying to keep it PG, you know. But know that, that God loves you. Use your struggle to be desperate for God. Use your struggles to reach out to God. Pray for one another. All of you who are tech savvy or doing all of that Facebook, Facebook, whatever you want to do, be encouraging. Use that platform to glorify God. And if you need those places where you feel like you got a vent, I want you to pick up the phone and call somebody. Don't put them out there. Call somebody who's going to love you to Jesus. Call somebody who's going to use the word of God. Not their opinions. Not what they think is better for you. Because even the doctors don't know what's best for you. But Christ does. Amen. I just wanted to love you in that. Don't forget where you come from. Don't forget your struggle is just as real as the next person. So be humble and be graceful. Love them to the beauty of Christ. Outside of that, the announcements that we have. Next week we have our Tuesday night's prayer. This calendar will one day be printed. Well, you can see them out there. But if you like me, I got to look real close. So next Tuesday, let me check out the date real fast. Oh, it's the following after that. So we get prayer nights bi-weekly. 
Tuesday nights from 6.30 to 7.30. The reason why we let you know now, so you know, can say Hawaiian, I never know. I gave you two weeks in advance. Yeah? Thursdays, if you interested in just come in and just you need one place to go and sit down relax just take it in maybe long days at work or long days with the kids or whatever might be come you're welcome to come sit here and just listen to the worship i'll be here you just need somebody to talk to somebody to pray with um just come we ohana best spot with god's ohana god bless you folks hope to see you next week Aloha, love you guys.